Good morning, hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends and guests here in person and virtually. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. My name is Myrna Peterson, and I am a member of our Board of Trustees. Reverend Teresa is taking the month of July off for study leave and vacation. Today's service is led by Pastor Joshua Berg, staff musician Carla Jamie Perez, and accompanist Wells Lang. Pastor Joshua is a celebrant and chaplain certified by the Humanist Society of which he was a board member for two years. His published writings appear in The Humanist Magazine, TheHumanist.com, The Detroit Jewish News, The LA Times Online, as well as other publications. Joshua graduated this past May with a Master's of Divinity degree from Meadville Lombard Theological School, entered into preliminary fellowship with the UUA, and was ordained a UU minister just this month on July 2nd. Joshua worked as the sabbatical minister at Emerson UU in Canoga Park from January through May of this year and is currently a contract minister at Northwest UU in Southfield, Michigan, as well as a freelance preacher nationwide. You may also have seen him around neighborhood helping out with the operations team. At the end of next month, he will begin a year residency as a chaplain at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. If you notice, there's a little two question survey on your seat, which is for our service today, so please fill that out if you'd like. And please take this moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed on YouTube, YouTube and which we are recording for future viewing. Seating is available in the back for those who want to be sure not to appear in the recording. Based on guidance from our COVID team, COVID safety team, masks are required indoors and optional outside. You'll find information on our website about the many ways to connect with our church community throughout the week, both in person and virtually. And now just a couple of short announcements. Do you like to sing? If you do, come add your voice to the Neighborhood Church Choir as they prepare for the August 14th Music Sunday service featuring the music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. The LOOP, and LOOP stands for Living Out Our UU Principles, focus groups will meet Wednesday, July 27th and Tuesday, August 2nd on Zoom, and in person next Sunday the 24th and August 7th after the service. Again, welcome to, to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Thank you, that was beautiful. All right. We light this chalice this morning for hope. According to Vaclav Havel, hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something's just going to turn out well. It is the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. This morning's reading is an excerpt from Belief in the Love of the World by Alice Walker, part one. My activism, cultural, political, spiritual, is rooted in my love of nature and my delight in human beings. When I am in the presence of other human beings, I want to revel in their creative and intellectual fullness, their uninhibited social warmth. I want their precious human radiance to wrap me in light I do not want fear of war or starvation or bodily mutilation to steal both my pleasure in them and their own birthright. Everything I would like other people to be for me, I want to be for them. I have been an activist all of my adult life, though I have sometimes felt embarrassed to call myself one. In the 60s, many of us were plagued by the notion that, given the magnitude of the task before us, the dismantling of American apartheid. Our individual acts were puny. There was also the apparent reality that the most committed, most directly confrontational people suffered more. The most revolutionary often ended up severely beaten, in prison or dead, shot down in front of their children, blown up in cars or in church, run over by racist drunks, raped and thrown in the river. It was perhaps in Mississippi during those years that, that I understood how the daily news of disaster can become, for the spirit, a numbing assault, and that one's activism, however modest, fighting against this tide of death, provides at least the possibility of generating a different kind of news, a news that empowers rather than defeats. There is always a moment in any kind of struggle when one feels in full bloom, vivid, alive. One might be blown to bits in such a moment and still be at peace. Martin Luther King Jr. at the mountaintop, Gandhi dying with the name of God on his lips, Sojourner Truth bearing her breast at a women's rights convention in 1851, Harriet Tubman exposing her revolver to some of the slaves she had freed, who, fearing an unknown freedom, looked long longingly backward to their captivity thereby endangering the freedom of all. To be such a person or to witness anyone at this moment of transcendent presence is to know that what is human is linked by a daring compassion to what is divine. During my years of being close to people engaged in changing the world, I have seen fear turn into courage, sorrow into joy, funerals into celebrations, because whatever the consequences, people, standing side by side, have expressed who they really are and that ultimately they believe in the love of the world and each other enough to be that, which is the foundation of activism. Our opening stance is found in your gray hymnal. Number 347, Gather the Spirit. Please stand in body or in spirit and greet the glorious morning with this opening hymn with me.
All right. So collectively, the world populace has been feeling quite a bit of fear and sorrow. I think you might agree. And there's almost certainly more to come. But in the spirit of faith that Alice Walker expressed in that reading, which is an excerpt from the introduction to her book, Anything We Love Can Be Saved, we will undertake a ritual today. She talked about turning funerals into celebration, sorrow into joy. Today, we're going to do a funeral at the beginning and a celebration at the end as a ritual. So right now, if you would pass, if you filled out those questions, any of you, if you'd pass them to the side, I'm going to actually pick them up. I'll now read the answers you've provided for the first question. The question is, please name one or two collective losses you feel we are mourning in our community. This will be our funeral ritual. We are mourning in our community, our society, our country, and in our world. Change is hard. We're mourning peace and many, many rights loss of my grandma. Roe, war, fear. They must be really feeling lost here because I can't even read what they wrote. Ah. Loss of I think it says courage, the belief that those in power will do the right thing. How many are feeling that loss right now? I had that belief too. Health, compassion, diminishing functioning democracy. We're all feeling these things. Continuing gun violence. I feel like screaming right now. Loss of abortion rights, threat of more loss of rights, loss of trust in our news media, loss of trust that government can be effective. We need to voice these things. It's important in community and beloved community to voice these things. Lack of common social or community experience. Loss of trust in government and democracy. It's a common one. Loss of reproductive rights. You see the patterns, bodily autonomy for people who can become pregnant loss of life from COVID-19 globally, loss or connection between Americans due to increased partisanship. Thankfully, we are here together. But yes, that is a very real grief. Resurgence of explicit racism, incivility in our country, loss of relatively predictable climate, physical safety, comfort, no build back better bill, less hope for a habitable world, for children and other living things. We have to talk about our losses, what we're mourning and what we're grieving. It's important. It's very, very difficult. We feel a deep sense of loss for all of these things mentioned that are so dear to us. We feel grief and sadness that much of what we loved so dearly and depended on spiritually is missing from our lives at this moment. However, even as we grieve, 
we know that we have retained, we have so many gifts and express our gratitude for all we have been given. As we celebrate the gifts we have received from these things we lost, when someone or something dies, we celebrate the gifts they put into the world. And as we celebrate the gifts received from all these things that we feel are gone, we know that that positive spirit that created these things originally still lives in the world. It still lives in our hearts. And we can be certain that that spirit and harnessing that spirit will provide the spark for the birth of a new energy and new and renewed gifts the world is currently enjoying and will certainly receive in the years to come. Please rise in body or spirit for, oh, are you gonna announce that, Carla, the meditative hymn? Sorry. <laughs> My mistake. This is, right. um, this is a meditative hymn, and this is from Ella's song, written by Bernice Johnson Reagan, and um, the words will appear on the monitors. Please sing along. <laughs> Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization. This week's gifts go to our own Building Bridges Task Force, which was formed in 2010 to forge connections between UUs and Muslims and with the broader community to stand up with and for Muslims against hate crimes and government assaults on civil liberties and to educate non-Muslims about Islam. The group's mission is to forge interfaith relationships through joint service projects and social events through which we can learn to understand each other better, support each other better, and to build relationships to bridge separations and differences and work to build a diverse, multicultural, interfaith beloved community in the Pasadena area. We are thrilled to be able to once again host the Building Bridges Interfaith Dinner and conversations tonight on the Labyrinth beginning at five. Your gifts will support that dinner and other interfaith activities throughout the year. Please give generously through our website, text to give or the QR code or box available at the exit. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the box outside. Thank you. 
Long ago and far away, before the world had come to this, I took for granted how my life would be, assuming that my freedom would be free. Before these evening shadows fell, I reveled in the light of day. I rarely ever cried, my patience wasn't dry, and heroes never died. But if I had my way, wouldn't come from a sky blue. Choices would be clear. Strangers would be kinder. Love a little blinder as it saved the day. If I had my way. of human kindness would seek us out and find us and color all the words we say. Carla Jamie Perez and Wells Lang. Thank you, it's beautiful. So, how did the celebrations uh, this month, the 4th of July, and if you didn't know, today is World's Day of International Justice on July 17th. How do these celebrations align with our Unitarian Universalist principles? 
which call us to act with justice, equity, and compassion in human relations toward a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and to work for universal liberty by accountably dismantling racism and other oppressions in ourselves and other institutions. I'm going to preach, it's going to be difficult, and then I'm going to turn it around into hope. Just wanted to prepare. These celebrations must also be a reminder to continuously reevaluate justice and what it means to say we live in a free and fair society. From my vantage of privilege, it feels great to just accept the oft-repeated adage that we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. Just feels good just to accept that. But in thinking more deeply about freedom, I now realize we can strive to be the land of freedoms, but only, only if we are indeed the home of the brave, the brave of spirit. Freedom is never pure, but it's rather this ever-shifting point around which humankind oscillates and it moving forward and back along a continuum between anarchy and authoritarianism. And the work to move that point toward an ever freer society is not a process that has an end, culmination. There are freedoms already many enjoy, just as many do not enjoy equal freedoms. And freedoms are forever gained and lost. As my awareness of the complexity of the idea of freedom comes into greater focus, I also understand more clearly how the price of that awareness, the price of knowledge, and especially the price of having freedoms at all, is indeed, as they say, vigilance. Constant vigilance to grow and sustain those freedoms. Vigilant courage and vulnerability to take essential risks. Vigilance to catch myself when I choose to rest on laurels or evade responsibility. And vigilance to enact the restorative justice necessary to reverse historic injustices, lest they continue to restrict all our freedoms. For revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Those words were spoken at the Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester, New York in 1852. That's six years after 1776. They were spoken by renowned American author, orator, statesman, abolitionist, and escaped slave, Frederick Douglass. In his speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? The fact is, Douglas states, the distance between this platform on which he stood that day and the slave plantation from which he escaped is considerable. He reminded the crowd, this 4th of July, he said, is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Right now, in numerous states in this union, today, where reactionary conservatives erroneously believe white people are under attack and they fear a loss of control when there is an honest accounting of our country's racial history, Douglas, Frederick Douglass's speech would be scrutinized today, would be criticized, and it would be likely censored or banned completely. Please think about that for a moment. The words of one of our most important American ancestors talking truth to power about the fact of our country's dehumanizing African Americans by keeping them in bondage might not be taught in 2022 for fear it would hurt a white person's 
feelings or make them look bad. That is unconscionable. Denial of history is just one tactic in the current drive to implement racist policies that restrict and deny civil and human rights. In fact, an honest accounting of our history plainly reveals the connections these policies have to the corresponding predecessor policies with more obvious but equivalent racist agendas. So we are not and will never be a free country. Stating that is not pessimism, in my opinion. Just as acknowledging our country's racism is not devaluing, that acknowledgement should be celebrated. Quite the opposite. Sustaining falsehoods and delusion or chasing some insatiable, unattainable freedom ideal is what will consign society to permanent bondage. Claiming freedom, rather, as imperfectible and focusing on the reality of our history, as painful as it is, enables setting achievable goals leading to realistic yet also radical and revolutionary action that can bring about the transformative change needed to achieve more equitable liberty. In working toward more freedoms, it's also important to be clear about what freedom is not. Lack of freedom, it means being hindered or re restricted. It means being held hostage physically, financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That is lack of freedom. The government of the United States has systematically and forcibly prevented many, African Americans especially, access to resources and opportunities, even while facilitating easy access to the same for white people for hundreds of years. And not only does the government continue to do so in more insidious ways, the repercussions of those generations of inequality resonate powerfully as a white person whose ancestors have cashed privilege for years, my ability to, for instance, get a loan to buy a car or drive the car without fearing arrest, far outweighs the ability of my African-American contemporary who has the additional burden of overcoming generations of injustice. Since the machinations of government in collusion with the powerful and advantage have historically conspired to restrict others from accessing the same, there exists today a stratification into privilege and exclusion, which creates inequities. Claiming equal distribution of goods and services, for instance, as that's fair and equal access, it's a complete deception because of this stratification. Setting aside non-essential consumer goods, consumer purchases, let's consider a life-saving medical procedure as an example. Even if relative freedom affords access to a qualified surgeon and the ability to undergo the procedure, we can't claim to be a free country if having the procedure would commit some, many people, resulting directly from government policy, racist policy, commit them to what is effectively debt servitude. Human rights like health care must be accessible to all equitably. As long as some are hindered or restricted, denied basic rights, held hostage by a capitalism that privileges the few over the many, we are not truly a free country. As long as the powerful and the power drunk, I might add, can hold the country hostage by extreme prejudice, fear-mongering, and othering to protect their wealth and dominion and assuage their irrational racist fears, we are not truly a free country. As long as Americans are not free to walk down a street if their skin is the wrong color, or children of any race are not free to go to school without fearing for their life, we are not truly a free country. And a tragic irony is that those in power, most often they don't understand that if they retain what they consider their freedom, 
by manipulating, ignoring, subjugating the safety and freedoms of others, then they too are not truly free. With their assumed freedoms being therefore tenuous at best, the country then falls victim to a destructive desperation to hold on to those freedoms. And we witness this desperation when control or the illusion of control is threatened. Just this past month, we heard the testimony of the January 6 hearings of election worker Shea Moss and her mother, Ruby Freeman, that their, their human right to live free from fear was stolen by Donald Trump because he feared loss of power and control. And the fact that Ms. Moss is someone whose very job it is to protect one of our most valuable freedoms, the right to vote, is yet another tragic irony, along with the fact that her mother's last name is Freeman. The U.S. is currently dominated by many so desperate to hold on to power, wealth, and control that they are willing to deceive and manipulate. They use means ranging from provoking fear and anger and direct violence to hiding like cowards behind coercively and subversively and illegitimately acquired rights masquerading as straightforwardly established law. Numerous government officials whose duty it is to protect life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, property, as outlined on July 4th in our Declaration of Independence. Numerous government officials are those same desperate few or collude with the same. So, get a move, move from funeral to celebration. How do we achieve equitable freedoms? so that we can celebrate the independence of our nation, so that we can celebrate the World Day of International Justice today. How can we promote the equity, justice, and compassion that our UU principles demand of us? I'll offer one solution. Certainly, we all have our own. It is my contention that a more solid foundation must be laid in the one powerful thing that diffuses hate and anger, that renders self-serving domination impotent. And get ready because here goes the new minister with that old standby, love. <laughs> I often feel like shouting to the rafters, no, forget love, we need justice. But justice preserves only what love reunites, contends the theologian Paul Tillich. Justice, he states, is violated when another's power of being is rejected. Justice is the form in which and through which love performs its work the channel through which the compulsive and forceful power of love is necessarily directed. And let me tell you, love isn't always pacifism. It's certainly not surrender or placation or pandering. There actually is no more powerful fight and no more potent and lasting justice than that achieved through the strength of love. We do need solutions that include specific, targeted, and radical action, but without a baseline of much more potent, unflinching love, none of these specific solutions will be achievable or effective. So resistance to what I'm suggesting is natural, especially to those like me who are comfortable in the status quo. It's understandable. The author, Bell Hooks, in her essay, Love as the Practice of Freedom, explains that recognizing the uncontestable humanity in each other requires giving up individual comfort and privileges. It also requires confronting violent oppression head on as many are forced to do because of this country's foundation in white supremacy culture. In fact, the reality is, as the bear is poked more and harder, we see we experience a desperately violent reactionary response, and we will for a long time to come. 
The struggle to kill or tame the bear will see many hurt and killed. But the good news is, witnessing more reactionary violence means more people are poking, more people are taking action to break that bear than ever have before. Langston Hughes cautions in his poem, Freedom, that freedom will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. So we must not be afraid. If we join together in ever greater numbers with love, not only for ourselves, but for that bear as well, we can succeed. Only love will bring into clear focus for many, especially in the privileged caste, the realities they fear to confront and are working to obscure and erase. Love facilitates going from fear to freedom. Every step we take, we need to figure out how to go from fear to freedom. Ultimately, only love can broaden concern to what is hurting the collective us. Besides freedom and fear, another ineffable F word, that's the title of this sermon, freedom and other ineffable F words. Another one is faith. And I'm not speaking of, of faith as it would be preached in many churches. I'm a humanist and I have faith in what I can observe using factual evidence to come to a conclusion. The rational facts are that our ancestors have achieved more freedoms over impossibly high obstacles and I have personally witnessed successes along the way to even more. So I am referring to faith in the power and the ability to individually and collectively love sufficiently to affect change that is progressive and revolutionary enough to sustain a society that is ever moving forward toward more and equal freedoms. That's the faith I'm talking about. When we leave here today, as that faith fades, and it will, toward unattainability, given the pain from the most recent devastating losses to freedoms that we talked about, please recall Bell Hook's words that once we choose love, we instinctively possess the inner resources to confront that pain. She reassures that moving through pain to the other side we find that joy, the freedom of spirit that a love ethic brings. So when we sit at home alone, as I do, screaming at the inconceivable wrong-minded thinking of so many, I transport myself back to this place and I ask you to do the same. This place in a beloved community like this of like-minded souls supporting each other through the struggle, change can come. Once again, evidence supports this faith because radical change has been catalyzed, promoted, and sustained by just such communities. It's a fact. So do we, as a species, have the ability to love as radically as is necessary to move from fear to freedom and save our world. Well, ultimately, regardless of how you arrive there, is there another rational conclusion but to have faith that we do? I have hope for America, not because we're the land of the free, but because I regularly witness brave people I respect and love, especially within our, our Unitarian Universalist faith communities, striving against great odds and often greater obstacles to move from fear to freedom. I regularly witness this. To move from fear to freedom with faith in our ability to love. I've seen it. And even though we are not and can never be a free country, we are a country that strives through action to overcome repressive and oppressive systems. Certainly many remain. But especially on holidays like today's World Day of International Justice, we can and should also celebrate the progress and the victories in the struggle for a more liberated, liberating, and just world. 
And I'll conclude with the words, words of Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Because as hard as we think we have it, imagine how hard this ancestor had it. As hopeless as we feel sometimes, listen to what Frederick Douglass said in 1852. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country, he wrote. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. He wrote, the arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I, Frederick Douglass, therefore, leave off where I began with hope. America as a verb. Oh, my country, tis of the promise of liberty. For all humanity, to this I sing. Oh, say, can you see the America that's free? The star-spangled banner of Lady Liberty? that welcomes every color, every nation, every creed, and measures good in sister brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, my country, tis of the promise of equality for all humanity. To this I sing. America the beautiful, tapestry of colors, where all defend the freedom and the rights of one another. From that bold declaration which our founders did assert, we rise again with strength of purpose, its truth to re-exert. Oh, my country, tis of the promise of justice for all humanity. To this I sing. Mine eyes have seen a vision, the coming of a vision yet to be, an America where the brave work towards liber liberty, a process of transformation for all the world to see, where each of us as stakeholders seek true equality. Oh, my country, tis of the promise of freedom for all humanity. To this I sing, let freedom ring. From Belief in the Love of the World by Alice Walker, part two. It has become a common feeling, I believe, as we have watched our heroes falling over the years, that our own small stone of activism, which might not seem to measure up to the rugged boulders of heroism we have so admired, is a paltry offering toward the building of an edifice of hope. This is the tragedy of our world for we can do nothing substantial toward changing our course on the planet, a destructive one without rousing ourselves, individual by individual, and bringing our small imperfect stones to the pile. All we own, at least for the short time we have it, is our life. With it we write what we come to know of the world. I believe the earth is good, that people, Untortured by circumstance or fate, 
are also good. I do not believe the people of the world are naturally my enemies or that animals, including snakes, are or that nature is. Whenever I experience evil, and it is not unfortunately uncommon to experience it in these times, my deepest feeling is disappointment. I have learned to accept the fact that we risk disappointment, disillusionment, even despair every time we act, every time we decide to believe the world can be better, every time we decide to trust others to be as noble as we think they are, and that there might be years during which our grief is equal to or even greater than our hope. The alternative, however, not to act and therefore to miss experiencing people at their best, reaching toward fullness has never appealed to me. I have learned other things. One is the futility of expecting anyone, including oneself, to be perfect. People who go seeking to change the world, to diminish suffering, to demonstrate any kind of enlightenment are often as flawed as anybody else, sometimes more so. But it is the awareness of having faults, I think, and the knowledge that this links us to everyone on earth that opens us to courage and compassion. It occurs to me often that many of those whom I deeply love are flawed. They might actually have said or done some of the mean things I felt, heard, read about, or feared. But it is their struggle with the flaw, surprisingly endearing, and the going on anyhow that is part of what I cherish in them. Sometimes our stones are, to us, misshapen odd. Their color seems off. Their singing comical and strange. Presenting them, we perceive our own imperfect nakedness, but also paradoxically, the wholeness, the rightness of it. In the collective vulnerability of presence, we learn not to be afraid. In this book, I'm writing about the bright moments one can experience at the pile, of how even the smallest stone glistens with tears, yes, but also from the light of being seen and loved for simply being there. Please rise in body or in spirit and open your hymn books, or you may look up here at the monitors for our final hymn, 121, We'll Build a Land.
soldiers and brothers, anointed by God, may then create peace. Where justice will roll down like waters, and peace like an ever-flowing stream. Fill the land where the mantles of praising breathe down from spirits once faint and once green, where like oaks of righteousness stand the people of the field of land, a people we seek. Oh, fill the land where sisters and brothers are not. don't even need to know the words. <laughs> it's so cool from this vantage point, this perspective, to see the, is it undulations of the crowd as, the, as the, they sing? It's, it's so powerful. Sorry for the word undulations. I don't know. <laughs> Who wants to celebrate now? That's what we need to do. So once again, in the spirit of faith, this benediction, the spirit of faith of Alice Walker expressed in her words, we will continue with our ritual, turning fear into courage, turning sorrow into joy, just as funerals, she wrote, can turn into celebrations. I'll now read the answers you have provided to the other question. Please name one or two things that we are, can, and or will be celebrating in our community, the larger society, our country, and our world. We're celebrating LA committed to 100% renewable power by 2035, yes. Woo, all right. Ban single-use plastics, SB 54, um, which is now law. Awareness that we need to treat each other better. As long as we have breath, joy is available within. That's beautiful. Rewriting our UU principles. Searching for a new minister. That's something to look forward to with joy. Change of seasons and continental growth, new scientific discoveries, clearer images of deep space. Have you seen this, these amazing images? Yes! <laughs> Woo! Responsible members of the Republican Party. <laughs> Stepping forward to push back on, the, on um, the truth deniers. Yes, Representative Cheney. Woo! Loss of trust. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Small, <laughs> small advances in gun control. Let's celebrate even the small advances. Um, National Suicide Prevention Month. Awesome. No? Let's celebrate. <laughs> Uh, the next generation, our children. Yes! I've heard my teenagers talk and it gives me hope in their strength. Individual acts of courage, which we see all the time, let's celebrate. Love, courage, once again. Can't read that one. Love, community, liberation, awesome. Moving on with hope and determination. Let us now celebrate these gifts we continue to receive. We feel joy and gladness that much of what we love and depend on spiritually is still with us. It is and will certainly manifest in our collective future. We know a positive spirit lives in our hearts, in the human heart. We can be certain that that spirit will provide the spark for the birth of new energy and new and renewed gifts the world is currently already enjoying, as we saw, and will certainly receive in the years to come. Amen.